Hello, hello, and welcome back to Trying to Figure It Out. My name is Allie, and here on Trying to Figure It Out, we do exactly what the name suggests. We try to figure everything out from mental health to navigating life in your 20s, navigating life in your 30s, relationships, family dynamics, so much more. And this week, we have with us Samantha Michelle. She is an internationally renowned DJ who has opened for legends like Duran Duran, Mark Ronson, and Miley Cyrus. And we're going to talk all about that lifestyle today. Welcome to Trying to Figure It Out. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited you're here. You're the first, like, honestly, you're the first music person I've had on the podcast. <sighs> which no is pressure. <laughs> it's cool because I used to work in the music industry and I'm like very involved in music. I was a music industry major. So I'm excited to talk to you about what you do and you know, your career and everything. So before we, you know, talk more about where you're at now and how you got into your career, you're originally from Toronto. What brought you to New York? And can you just tell me a little bit about how you got into everything that you do now? Totally. So I grew up in Toronto. I grew up in quite a, like, provincially mindsetted bubble, I guess is really the best way to put it. Like, Toronto's an amazing urban epicenter um, but the particular community that I grew up in was quite traditional and rigid and Mm -hmm. I didn't fit with that (laughs) so for as long as I can remember like escape was the goal and for me that was facilitated by university so Mm -hmm. I got into NYU and I came here and I was 17 I had no idea what I wanted to be or what I wanted to do I just knew that I didn't want like what everyone I grew up with was you know into relatable yeah (laughs) yeah and um and then New York was just like you know going down like Alice in Wonderland's rabbit hole yeah right like I was in the village I was 17 turning 18 I fell right into New York nightlife like going out to all those clubs and meet backing you know this Mm -hmm. is uh, 2007 right and I just really found my people like in these kind of alternative subcultural scenes um all the while i was like a straight a student because virgo i don't know whatever (laughs) um that's that's what was kind of asked of me and then after college i started working as an actress and that became you know i had some success in my early 20s but i think i felt frustrated by the lack of like creative autonomy that comes with that particular profession because you know, you're really going in trying to like fulfill other people's visions. And I think I was somebody who always wanted to be the vision maker. But at that age, I I didn't really feel comfortable to pursue that or or know how to pursue that. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up living in London. And so somewhere along the way in my like early 20s in London, I plugged in my iPod at a party at the Groucho Club. And I played like really fun, silly throwback stuff. Like Mm -hmm. everything from like Aqua's Barbie Girl to like... Uh, rockabilly Mm -hmm. dion sam cook that kind of stuff and there was one moment where i played hey jude and (laughs) everyone at this party like got on the furniture hands in the air going nah nah, nah." (laughs) and i'm like standing there like 23 years old like like, what is that having just pressed a button on an ipod you know (laughs) and i realized like that there was something there yeah but it took years before i even like got into calling myself a DJ or being a DJ or pursuing that, there was a lot of resistance from my end. And after that night, people kept on like hitting me up with these opportunities to DJ. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm not a DJ. I yeah. No, wasn't interested. And then eventually I kind of caved on an opportunity. And then one thing led to another. And then I became half of a female DJ duo with a girlfriend of mine. And this was like 2016. So it was a really cool, interesting moment for like women and women empowerment yeah and so that adventure ran for about three years we were called the smoking guns we played like 60s and 70s northern soul and rock and roll and you know big on our deep cuts and presented a radio show and we were in a very male dominated space um particularly with the genres we were playing and we were just kind of like whatever you know (laughs) that's amazing it was awesome it was really awesome and then off the back of that I decided to move back to New York in 2018 and begin kind of building out my own name and brand and Mm -hmm. in the music space and in the DJ space and and moving more into electronic music and dance music and creating more original sounds through mashups and remixes and original edits and that's kind of where I'm at now. That's amazing. Well, first off, congratulations, obviously. It's a huge feat to be where you are. And it's still, I mean, 100% a predominantly male space, but 
I'm glad that the world has changed a lot and there are tons of female DJs now. I think it's really interesting what you said about acting because I feel like a lot of people view acting as like a creative job or industry in general, but it is very true. You're fitting into a role that's already created and you're trying to like put yourself into that mold. And I think it's cool to see that that transition for you to being a DJ. And I feel like it's interesting because so many people could have gone so many different routes. And for you, you went like such a creative route where you have total control over every single thing that you're putting on that, like on the speakers. And that's really, really cool. Thank you. It's interesting. I think, you know, I, I didn't grow up wanting to be an actor or a DJ or whatever. I kind of fell into taking acting classes in New York when I was like 18, 19. Mm-hmm. And, and I loved the performance element of it. Like yeah. I grew up dancing competitively. I am an adrenaline junkie, like through and through. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of element of acting and the, the safe space that it offered to like kind of dig deeper into some of my own like right. feelings and emotional truths was really exciting to me. But then there is the very practical limitation of like you're you're there to fit somebody else's vision and totally. whether or not you fit their vision has so little to do with you, your skill, your training, your talent, your abilities. Yeah. And that's a really disenfranchised way to move through life. And if you're totally. a creative person who's like desperate to share your truth mm-hmm. in whatever means like being an actor is kind of like walking through life like muzzles with your hands tied behind your back waiting for somebody to untie your hands so that you can do something in their world right versus what i'm trying to do now like there's still tons of adrenaline and tons of tons of performance and tons of collaboration but i'm i'm really at the helm of of what i'm creating and what it says in the world yeah 100 percent. i definitely relate for me when i I mean, I went to a small private school in Westchester, so I'm from New York originally. Most of my like high school and middle school friends all live in New York City. A lot of them work in finance. A lot of them, you know, some of them have creative jobs, but they're still very much like following a track. And I think that for me, that just never really made sense to me. But if you asked me when I was 15, if I thought I'd ever have a podcast, like I just think that doing whatever feels right to you as a woman, whether that is working in finance and like pushing the boundaries there, or if that's doing whatever feels right in a certain month for you like it's all okay and it's like that is women empowerment just trusting that whichever track you choose if you decide to work finance and then two years later realize fuck it I'm gonna go work in fashion like you can literally do whatever you want I think that that's like the beauty of where we are in the world right now and we still have a lot of work to do and a lot more progress to make but I mean, people like you are paving the way for a lot of people, and it's amazing. So, well, I think I think you pointed to a really awesome, uh, you know, development of humankind in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Like, certainly when I was going into college and university, there was a lot of pressure that like mm-hmm. what you studied should somehow like set you up for life. And like, I ended up studying, technically speaking, I built my own major studying the role of religion yeah. in the rhetoric of U.S. foreign policy. Wow. (laughs) And now I'm a DJ, you know, (laughs) like I'm a real overeducated DJ. Um, But, but, you know, I learned how to think critically. I learned how to write. I learned how to express myself. Like, I think that education is available in so many different ways, institutionalized, YouTube, you name it. And like the thing that I've found as far as like trying to have success with something is, is exactly what you're saying. Like figuring out what it is that you bring to the space, what 100%. your truth is, what your authenticity is, and then you'll figure out the technical stuff along the way. 100%. So we talked a little bit about your start in the industry, how people were coming up to you. You started getting messages about gigs and you were kind of like, no, I'm not a DJ, I'm not a DJ. Then you became a DJ <laughs> and now you're doing great. Were there ever moments at the beginning of your career or even now where being a woman stopped you from having success or someone said no to you or didn't give you an opportunity because you were not the traditional image of what a DJ looks like? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. There was actually a a really like visceral occasion a couple months ago that was like, it was in Miami. It was at some friend's party and this guy I know like had invited me to the party and the whole thing is like Miami Vice themed and I'm like daring when it comes to sartorial choices and yeah. very when in Rome in my approach. So I'm like there in my little like fuchsia cutout dress, <laughs> whatever, like nodding hard to the Miami Vice theme. And um, my friend who had invited me to this party was like, oh, it'd be great if you could like hop on and play for a bit. And normally that's not how I go about doing my job, but this is a longtime friend. And I was like, all right, I'm happy to make an exception. Right. 
And so I get there, whatever. I like bring my stuff, like introduce me to DJ that I'm taking over from. And then it like comes time to take over. And there's like these two other random like guy DJs there. And I find myself on stage at this like fancy party on Hibiscus Island with three other male DJs, the birthday boy and this friend of his who's invited me to the party. And I'm like all teed up, ready to take over. And right. the birthday boy is like, oh, no, no, this guy's going to play. And he looks at me like, who is this Barbie? Right. Like, I'm about to start. It's like, no, no, move over, girl. And puts this other guy on. And the other guy was so bad. He cleared the party. He blew the speakers. And the whole thing was like, done. Done. And I was really upset about it. And I confronted the guy who invited me and was like, dude, what? Yeah. And he just kept saying, well, they don't know who you are. They don't know who you are. And I'm like, but who the hell am I? I'm a person. Yeah. And who are the other people? And who are those people? <laughs> What's the and difference? What is this? Like some like competition of like who's got a bigger ego or who's yeah. got more anything? Like that dude blew your party. Literally. Literally. And your gear. Like, and everyone left. And I really in that moment felt like, okay, here I am in this like little stupid pink dress on stage with five dudes. Yeah. And they're all looking at me like, you know, this guy's probably trying to bang me and he's trying to like, let me DJ or whatever yeah. so he can get in my pants. And I was like, I'm not banging any of you. That's not what this is about. I'm like trying to do something nice for you. I could have popped this party off for yeah. you all. That's my speciality. <laughs> um, but instead, like, you're just looking at me like, yeah, I'm an object. That's horrible. Yeah. And I think that part of what made that whole experience so like viscerally, Ugh, was that friend that had invited me was somebody that I knew from like my early 20s when I was living in LA and doing the acting thing. And my first two agents both like dropped me because I wouldn't sleep with them. And in the Me Too thing that happened five, six years later, they were both outed and, you know, whatever. But like that was super hard for me in my early 20s of to course. figure out and to figure out how to deal with. And so this friend was someone I'd reconnected with recently, but there were a lot of people at that party that I knew from that time. Yeah. So I felt very reminded of a time in my life where I was much less empowered than I am now. 100%. And also somebody at that party fully groped my ass like an hour after this business about the DJ thing happened. Right. So I felt like the whole thing was like I just walked it's into like some time warp, you know, yeah. from like a pre Me Too world where men think it's okay to like treat women like this. Yeah. And it was gross. Yeah, I mean, it still it was 100% exists. It's sad to hear that it's 2023 and that happened this year. Like, yeah, that's and that was like April, yeah. you know, like, like I was expecting your story to be from when you first started or like five, six years ago, you know, yeah. a lot longer back than April. It's definitely sad, but the amazing thing is that you're still doing it and you can't give up. That's the most important Listen, part. I find those moments so motivating. That's amazing. So you talked a little bit about having agents that dropped you. Where are you at now with having agents or, you know, being a part of a label or looking into those kinds of things? Um, I've got a pretty big team now, almost all women, which is really cool. It just sort of worked out that way. In my early 20s, I approached everything in my business with this assumption that I was like lucky to be given opportunity. Totally. And it's taken me 10 years and I'm still very much in this process like yeah. of learning to shrug that off. It's hard, I think, especially being that I entered into industry as an actor, whereby like your agent calls and says, hey, you have an audition on the other side of the country tomorrow. Can you memorize 10 pages and get yeah. your butt there so somebody might look at you for three minutes? And you're like, well, yes, I can. Yeah. Fabulous. I'm on my way. And so when that's how you enter into the workplace, mm -hmm. it's very hard. It's very, very hard to, to let go of that and to go, actually, my time is as valuable as anybody else's. 100%. You know, and regardless of how old I am or how much money I make or how many people work on me or next to me or around me, like my time counts. I count. A hundred percent. And I'm still learning to like find my voice in all of that. Totally. I think. So to go back to more of your music, because I want to know more about your music taste. Uh, I want to know what do you like to listen to and what do you think that the people get the most excited to hear when you're DJing? Great question. <laughs> I'm going to separate them. So what I like to listen to, truthfully, the music that like really feels like it turns my soul on fire is like folk rock and rock and roll music from the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So like Dylan, Springsteen, 
the band, Creedence Clearwater, Tom Petty, like Van Morrison, mm -hmm. those kind. I mean, I know I've only just named men, but like that, that kind of canon of music mm -hmm. really does something for me. As far as like female vocalists, like the stuff that came out of the 60s, like Aretha Franklin and like Mary Queenie Lyons and like, you know, some of the women who played with James Brown, like mm -hmm. the, that whole Mary Clayton, like that, that whole kind of elk of amazing 60s powerhouse soul 100%. singers who derive from the big mamba and thornton like blues tradition of the 50s like that stuff really just <laughs> love it <laughs> yeah. love it um and then as far as what i like to play when i'm djing it really depends on the on the particular event and also right. just my mood these days i like to play a lot of like dance and electronic remixes of classics because I think it's really fun to toy and play with expectation in that way totally. like oh you know this song but yeah. you don't know it this way yeah. and you didn't see it coming like that and like creating when you're working with electronic music because you have these clean four on the floor beats and loops and whatnot you can create live mashups and you can put different songs together creating yeah. original soundscapes in the moment that like you've never heard before never mind the audience has never heard before and right. that's what makes it really fun so I love love playing dance music for that reason and mm -hmm. my style is very nostalgic but very upbeat and very accessible and very ecstatic there's a strain of dance music that's much more kind of hypnotic like trance techno that kind of thing mm -hmm. I'm kind of on the other side of the playing field where it's more about kind of building it up yeah reaching like a crescendo and then letting it all explode <laughs> <laughs> um, and for that. me that really creates these like incredible moments with audiences where everybody feels like they're hooked in together on a build and then 100%. when it drops it's like everyone it's like going on a sonic roller coaster yeah. together and you're just bringing people together it's yeah that's the best it there's is nothing the best. better than being at a party with good music like nothing exactly because it helps us escape our like oneness mm -hmm. and our aloneness right like regardless of whether you're partnered or unpartnered or live with seven people or whatever it might be like there is a fundamental oneness of being alive that is difficult and I think that music being this like incredible language between like we mortals and the divine like creates this amazing space um to transcend all of the icky stuff that feels really human and when we enter into that um transcendence like together and community totally it can be really transformative for sure so like I mentioned at the beginning, you've opened for some pretty big names in the industry, which is amazing, including Duran Duran, who I love Duran Duran, um, yeah. Mark Ronson and Miley Cyrus. What was it like opening for them? And how did you get in the position to open for them? They were all you know, different adventures. Mark Ronson was the first like kind of, I guess, big name that I got to open for that was in 2019. It just so happened that I connected with somebody at Wall Street Journal and um, they were excited about working with me. They met me playing like 60s ska remixes of Rolling mm -hmm. Stone songs. And they were like, who is this girl? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm about. And they, yeah, they knew they wanted to work with me in Cannes that year. And then Mark uh, kind of got in the mix with that. And then they were, you know, one day I just got a text message saying, hey, Samantha, we'd still really love you to be a part of our event at Cannes Lions. But uh, we've actually got Mark Mark Watson booked. How would you feel about opening for him? Yeah. And I was like, I'm so great about that. <laughs> that would be amazing. Let's do that. Yeah. Um, so that was incredible. And then off the back of that, I had the chance to do it again at Davos at the World Econo Economic Forum. And that was in 2020 in January. And then we were scheduled to do it again in Cannes Lions of that year. But then obviously the pandemic had its way with that. Right. The Duran Duran thing was similar. I got a call one day last August, like from my agent saying, Hey Sam, like, do you want to open for Duran Duran and Al Rogers on Sunday? Like it was like five yeah. days out and I was like, I'm sorry, am I reading this right? Like, <laughs> what? Yes. Yes. And it was at the the Budweiser Stadium. It used to be the Molson Amphitheater. Um, which is where it's like a big outdoor arena in mm -hmm. Toronto. And it's where I saw my first ever concert, the Spice oh, Girls, amazing. 1998. So it was really special to like go back to the first live performance I ever saw as a kid For and sure. get to be on that stage and like kind of pop my stadium cherry like that. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> it was really cool. And it's like where you're from. It, totally. So. My parents came and then we all got to watch the show together. And mm -hmm. I'd never been to a concert with both of my parents in my whole life. Like, yeah. 
it was really magic. And now I get to do it again. I'm opening for Duran Duran and Nile Rogers again, um, this time at the Scotiabank Arena, also in Toronto. So and that's where I grew up watching like the Maple Leafs play. I'm a mm-hmm. big hockey fan. I really just like can't believe that that's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I Congratulations. can't. Congratulations. That's amazing. So I have a couple like funny DJ questions okay. for you because as a person who goes to parties and loves music, I feel like there's like certain things that DJs can't stand. Okay. So... Scale of one to 10, how much does it drive you crazy when someone requests a song? (laughs) Like five. Five, because it depends on the context, like everything. If I'm playing like a Tina Turner remix and somebody goes, can you play some Prince? Like, yes, Mm -hmm. of course I can. Right. With respect. Absolutely. (laughs) You know, but if I'm, and this happened in my, on my tour in June, I was at disco party, like a very clear Studio 54 themed disco party playing like deep cuts of the disco era. And some guy comes over to me with a $100 bill and hands me this $100 bill and goes, I want you to play some Wu-Tang Clan. And I'm like, (laughs) are you missing the sequins everywhere? Respectfully, no. (laughs) Like, respectfully, no. Like, what? So when people, when people say things like that, that just, that just don't really acknowledge the fact that they're in a communal space, it would be like walking into a restaurant and going, I've got a fabulous idea. How about everybody in this French restaurant suddenly get served tuna sashimi? Yeah. You're like, great, I'm glad you want tuna sashimi. Go to a Japanese restaurant. Here we are in the French restaurant. No one here wants that. 100%. You know? Another DJ question. What do you have to say to the people who argue that DJs are just standing on the stage pressing a button and making it look like they're doing stuff, but they actually aren't like actively doing anything while they're up there? Um, well, listen, those people exist. By the way, I don't think that. That was more of just a question. No problem. <laughs> those people for sure exist. So I can understand other people having an attitude about that like those people exist usually they're people who have like really big like followings on social media or whatever because otherwise like they wouldn't get away with it probably yeah what I do is nothing like that like for me I don't preset anything like I never know what song I'm going to start with I never know what song I'm going to play next even the stadium shows I'm like for me I have to be able to feel it it's an intuitive thing and And so everything that's happening when I'm on stage in front of people is happening live in the moment. And I am Mm -hmm. literally making it up as I go and hoping for the best. (laughs) And that's the kind of fun of it. You know, other DJs work different ways. There's a lot of DJs I know who will plan all their tracks, all of their cue points, and they know exactly when they're going in and out of what song. There's other DJs I know that like literally they're playing a preset set and they're busy throwing cake at the audience or whatever. Like... (laughs) To each his own. I understand that there's a spectacle yeah. element to this job, but for me, being authentic is the most important thing. So mm-hmm. I can't feel like I'm pulling one over on my audience. Like, yeah. It just doesn't work for me. Is there someone with a really big following that you look up to the most or think has like stayed the most authentic to like actively DJing while like having the gross amount of fans that they have? Yeah. I mean, I think like Tiesto. You know, like he's one of the biggest and the best. He's been at it forever. Mm -hmm. But like I saw him play in L.A. in January and I was lucky enough to be able to kind of watch from the side of the stage. And like he's just like playing his tracks, doing his thing. Like you can tell he's figuring out where he wants to go with the set next in real time. He's having a good time. You know, obviously he's got a huge audience like his sound is mm-hmm. so specifically his sound, like massive, massive respect for him. For Sophie sure. Tucker, yeah. you know, they're newer on the scene and they've had like an incredible last couple of years yeah, as far amazing. as, you know, how they've evolved and the audience and I guess the fans that they've accrued. Mm-hmm. But what they do is so cool. Um, Rufus to Soul. Yeah, I love like, Rufus. I mean, Rufus to Soul Live is like the best thing ever. Talk about plant medicine, you know what I mean? Like it will reorient the fibers of your being. For sure. A lot of DJs now like Tiesto or Mustard or like all these different DJs basically produce a lot of music as well. They make albums with people and that's like totally separate from them doing a Vegas residency. Do you see yourself getting into that or like producing for other artists in that same way? Yeah, totally. So I was actually in the studio last night until pretty late I'm working on like what would be my first EP of like my own original electronic dance music Mm -hmm. which is so exciting but also like so overwhelming because there's just like so much that you can do it's very 
very exciting. And definitely that's a space that I want to be working collaboratively in. And I'm excited to be able to hopefully collaborate with lots of different people in that, in that yeah. context. That's amazing. I feel like that's a perfect transition into what is next for you and what you have lined up that you're excited about. So I've got some cool stuff happening this week. Tomorrow I go out to the Hamptons. On Friday I'm working with this amazing organization called Generation SOS. And they are an organization based in New York, but they also have chapters in Florida and around the country. And they facilitate community and safe spaces for kids and teenagers to discuss issues around mental health and substance abuse and misuse. Um, It's very cool. Their program isn't predicated on abstinence or anything like Mm -hmm. that. It's really about facilitating yeah, the, these spaces for honest and vulnerable for conversations sure. and, you know, a destigmatization of mental health issues that face teenagers. I think that the work that they do is really incredible. I wish that that kind of thing was available to me when I yeah. was a kid. So in 2021, we worked together. I emceed and DJed at their annual summer event. But what's really cool is the event, you know, involves these these kids in the community really predominantly and like seeing these 17 year olds get on stage yeah. and talk in front of hundreds of their families and friends and peers and have you know the program is live streamed across four or five different platforms so they're talking right. to millions and millions of people and they're getting up there behind the microphone talking about their struggles with addiction eating disorders grief like you have it and it's just unbelievably unbelievably inspiring so I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of that, especially as a DJ, you know, that's a job that's become so synonymous with excess, especially mm-hmm. as it relates to substances. And DJing, I think, is also something that young people especially think of as some kind of like status symbol, cool thing. Right. And to be able to like represent this group of young people that actually you can excel in that context and not think it's cool to be off your face on a daily basis. Right feels a little refreshing. So 100%. I'm happy to be part of presenting that. 100%. That kind of is a good segue into another question I wanted to ask you is what is your opinion as a DJ on like the whole culture of people going to DJ sets and listening to house music because they're taking very hard drugs like Molly or ecstasy or whatever it is. As a DJ, do you feel like you try to, you know, gather a crowd of people who aren't of that nature? Or do you like give in to that nature? Like what is... What is your opinion on that? Um, well, it's definitely true, you know, and I think that for me, the kinds of sounds that I'm interested in making like are on the other side of that spectrum. Right. So the kind of stuff that you're describing is much more in that like hypnotic trans techno, yeah. like it's four o'clock in the morning. And yeah. like, this is so amazing. But like for me, I'm not going to listen, make, create or play anything out that I wouldn't want to listen to dead sober yep. at four o'clock in the afternoon on my like on a walk with my dog 100%. you know like for me it's everything is like groove oriented it's gotta yeah. get in the shoulders it's gotta <laughs> make you feel good you know and if it makes you feel good you don't need drugs to make it make it make you for feel sure. good music that's dark and dungeony and like monotonously intense like does not make you feel good and if you were on drugs it might make you feel okay but right. like again i think drugs just tend to typically enhance right whatever's going on so I try and make what's going on feel really good and really positive so that Mm -hmm. drugs don't become a necessity yeah, or even really kind of what it's about. A hundred percent. We're getting towards the end, but I want to ask you what advice you have for women who are following in your footsteps or women who were in the position you were in 10 years ago when you didn't know what you wanted to do, but you knew you wanted to do something more creative. I think the biggest piece of advice that I've just kind of been telling myself like this week in real time, is like, you can do anything. You know, Mm -hmm. like you can really do anything. I think that I was told in so many ways by so many people in school, in camp, at home, that like my skills or talents were limited Mm -hmm. or that certain things weren't realistic or that I should be practical. Like as early as like second grade, why, you know, I was good at writing, so therefore I wasn't good at math. Like right. You will be good at whatever you tell yourself you can be good at. I think it's just really important, women especially, but everybody to give yourself the space to go, I can be good at whatever I choose to be good at because you will, because perspective and like you create reality with your own perception of yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think 
the most important thing is to quiet all of the people that told you that you, that wasn't realistic or that that wasn't available to you or that your real talents are over. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you can do anything. 100%. Something I do in every episode is called LPs 3. I basically try to bring music into the podcast, which we've done a great job of doing already this entire episode, great. but we're just going to keep going with it. What I usually do is I add in three songs. I have my guests share three songs that, you know, fit the theme of what we talked about in this episode. So I guess for you, I want to ask, what are three songs that have inspired you the most along your journey of being a DJ? I know that's an impossible that's question. That's such a hard question, but we'll go based on... I feel like Hey Jude has to be in there. Hey Jude is for, in everywhere. Hey Jude, <laughs> for sure. That was the first song that I ever played out to people mm-hmm. and realized that if you that there is such magic in just playing the right song at the right, right moment. DJing is more than that. It's transitions, it's technicality, it's performance, all of that. But when you distill it down, in my Mm -hmm. opinion, as to what makes a good DJ, allegedly, it's knowing how to play the right song in the right moment. That moment made me feel a part of something in a way that I'd never felt before. Mm -hmm. So totally. Another big one was The Coasters Down in Mexico. It's like a deeper cut soul song from the 60s, but it was used in um, this Tarantino film, Death Proof. And it's so (laughs) <laughs> and then the third the third would probably be oh um country summer which is like a mashup of indian summer by jai wolf which is mm-hmm. one of my favorite electronic dance songs and country grammar by nelly and it. oh my god <laughs> the build and the drop in this song i think i find a way to play it at like every gig, every time you every, do gig, every gig <laughs> um it's such a journey and like people love it and it puts these like really unique sounds together in an incredibly brilliant way that's amazing well thank you so much where can everyone find you if they want to follow along your journey instagram is my consolidated resource um you can find me at samantha music it's nice and easy um and that's kind of the best place amazing i read my dm so say hi amazing okay well thank you guys all so much for listening i will see you all next week and thank you samantha Thank you, Allie.